The civil service. In total, there are roughly 4,000 civil servants. They are defined by the characteristics that they are permanent, politically neutral, anonymous, and subservient. The fact that they are permanent refers to the fact that they are not changed with each government. Civil servants stay for long periods of time and are not affected by politics, which also means that they are neutral. Civil servants have been split from advising and implementing policy to just advising government on policy in a politically neutral manner. There are now around 140 next step agencies, many of which are private, headed by CEOs on fixed term contracts, which are hired by the government to implement policies, unlike in previous years when it was civil servants who advised the government on what to do and their different options, and then went and implemented it as well. Cameron also increased the number of special advisers he had, despite saying that he would not. Now, special advisers are politically biased versions of civil servants, so they advise politicians on what to do, but in a political manner, whereas civil servants merely advise of all the options and do not weight any above any of the others. In terms of political neutrality, Civil servants aren't allowed to be affected by politics or politicians. However, some have been in the past. For example, Sir Duncan Nichols, under Thatcher, was the NHS chief executive who was used in 1997 to rubbish Labour's NHS policies. Therefore, it was obvious that when Labour won in 1997, he had to go as he was not politically neutral because he sided with the Conservatives and had previously been under Thatcher and very influenced by her. Sir John Scarlett, under Blair, was accused of sexing up the Iraq report. Now, how anonymous civil servants are has decreased in recent years, as civil servants can be called to appear in front of select committees, which are now televised. It is not, however, obligatory for civil servants to appear in front of select committees if their minister tells them not to. And in fact, Margaret Thatcher made four civil servants not appear in front of select committees. When civil servants are questioned by select committees, they can only say what their minister asks them to say and nothing else. And if they are asked too complicated a question, they will say, that is a question for my minister. On the other hand, ministers have also blamed civil servants, who can say nothing due to the Official Secrets Act, but have been blamed anyway. So an example was the immigration minister under Brown blamed civil servants over Romanian immigrants. However, the civil servants went public saying it was a political decision and nothing to do with them. Another example was the case of Clive Ponting, which was where an Argentinian ship was sunk by the British despite not being in an exclusion zone and it was sailing away. Tom Dallywell, an MP, asked the Ministry of Defence a question and the minister lied. Clive Ponting, the civil servant, then told the truth to Tom Dallywell, the MP. Clive Ponting was taken to court and said he told the truth as it was in the public interest. However, Justice McGowan ruled that civil servants have no public interest defence. And therefore, Clive Ponting was not allowed to say this and no civil servants are allowed to expose truths like this as they have no public interest offence. Even so, he was then tried by a jury who found him not guilty despite full well knowing what he'd done. Finally, the matter of subservience. It is often argued that civil servants are not subservient and in the liberal bureaucratic model, it is argued that, that civil servants are more powerful than ministers 
as they have more experience and knowledge in a specific area, whereas ministers often have only worked there for a few months and therefore do not know everything about it. As well as this, there are six to seven mandarins, or high up civil servants, per minister. And so they outnumber ministers quite heavily. Civil servants are also more likely to spend more time on an issue because the minister also ha is an MP and so has constituency matters and, um, and rulings in parliament to get on with, whereas the civil servants only work on the cases in their ministry. It is estimated that civil servants spend around four hours on each point or each case for every hour that a minister spends on it. This means they spend much more time getting to know cases and therefore know much more about it. Finally, the civil servants are bound by a professional ethos, which means they are united and sing from the same hymn sheet, whereas ministers are often divided. And so the civil servants can seem stronger against the ministers. All in all, however, the civil servant is still largely permanent because the 140 plus agency chiefs are a very small percentage of the civil service. Straw, Cook and Blair praised the civil service for the way it adjusted to a new Labour government after a long period of conservatives, and the vast majority of the civil servants remain anonymous. Most ministers get on with their civil servants and understand that they are there to serve the ministers and not in charge. Therefore, most of these changes have been exaggerated. The final thing that civil servants are bound by is the Osmotherly rules. This means that civil servants cannot say at what level decisions are made and the advice that civil servants give is excluded from the Freedom of Information Act.